let's, let's bow our heads and let's pray. Father, we give you thanks for today, for loving us, for caring for us, and for keeping us safe. And thank you for the past week that you've been with us. And we're grateful for our brothers and sisters in this place, that we can come together and hear your word and praise you and worship you together. And guide our conversation, guide our time together tonight as well. Anoint your servants, Lord. Guide my mouth that everything that comes forth from my mouth will be your words alone. Words that will be edifying, that will be rebuking, that will be transforming and helping us up, Lord, to be, to be more like you, more, your, more like your sons, Jesus. And we pray all this in your son's name, Jesus. Everyone say, Amen. Amen. Let me start by asking you this question. Are you a forgetful kind of person? Um, you know, thinking about that, I, I don't think I am. Um, a forgetful kind of person in the sense that I don't always ask like, oh, where's my phone? Uh, where's my key? Where's my wallet? Because I know some of you could be like that, it's like constantly, because Poppy's like that. Like every day, Poppy will be asking me, have you seen my phone? Right? Um, I'm, I'm not. I'm not forgetful in that sense. But I am forgetful in the sense that I tend to forget details that happened some time ago. Details that I don't believe it's important, but to Poppy, for example, it's an important thing, right? So he would say something like, oh, I told you about that. Like, no, I don't know. Tell me again, right? So, so I don't remember a lot of details from events that I think that, well, it's not that important. Um, but... You know, that kind of forgetfulness has caused me a lot of problems, right? Um, especially with Poppy. Well, we, we get into some arguments sometimes because of, you know, she expects me to remember certain things that I, you know, somehow conveniently forget. But that's relationship, isn't it? That's the, the good thing about relationship, you know. You, you learn what's important about your, to your spouse and that you sort of like, yeah, I need, I need to be more, you know, more like that kind of person that she expects me to be or he expects me to be. Um, for example, another thing about being forgetful, how about books, right? We, I'm sure some of us have read books. Do you remember the books that you've read? I'm not talking about the title, right? Most people remember, oh yeah, I've read the books, right? Most people know that, but I'm talking about, do you remember the content within the pages of the books that you've read? say, five years ago, right? What's in it? Like, I, I tend to forget a lot of those things, right? So I need reminder. If, if I want to remember things from, like, the content of a book, I need to read multiple times. I need to, you know, read once, and then next year I need to read it again, and following year I need to read it again. And so that, that is why I guess you can't read the Bible once and say, oh, I read the Bible. That's why we keep reading it, right? Because we need to be reminded because we, we tend to forget um, about what we read. So I, you see, that, 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 I think that's normal to forget and that is part of being human, to forget things. You know, we, we don't remember 100%. We don't remember everything. And I believe the Colossians are the same. They're just like us. They, they, they're human beings and being human, you, you tend to forget. And I believe today what we're going to cover today is a passage which is Paul thanksgiving to God for the Colossians. And he gives thanks in a way of reminder to the Colossians. And we'll see how, how that plays out later on together. So, so this part here, verses 3 to 8, you know, I, I managed to cover two verses last time. I, you know, I'm a temp here like you know six verses so I might be usually I'm rushing towards the end so I hopefully I'm gonna cover the the main really solidly and then we have to probably rush a bit towards the end as we get hungry as well so so the three verses three to eight right so let's let let me just read that again so we we get remind being reminded again of, of what verses three to eight is all about in uh, Colossians 1 we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. Since we heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints because of the hope laid up for you in heaven. 
Of these you have heard before in the word of the truth, the gospel, which has come to you as indeed in the whole world. It is bearing fruit and growing as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. Just as you learn it from Epaphras, our beloved servant, fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So this part is a common part in, uh, in, in Paul's letters. Paul wrote 13 letters in the New Testament. Out of the 13 letters, 12 of them contain thanksgiving with the exception of Galatians. Galatians don't have that because Paul was so mad to the church, to the Christian in Galatia, he just go, that's it, you know, I'm just going to straight writing to you what, what, what's in my heart, right? But here, it's a very typical of, of Paul's letters, you know, of the 12, of the 13, 12 of them contain some sort of thanksgiving. Verse 3, he says, we always thank God, the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you. The first thing I want to mention here is when Paul says, we always thank God, the Father of Lord Jesus Christ, when we pray for you, it doesn't mean that he always thanking God for the church in Colossae. What he's saying here is, whenever he prays for the church in Colossae, he always thanks God. There's a huge difference there, right? Because people say, oh, that is not true. How can Paul do that? There's no way he can always thanking God for them. What Paul is saying here is when he pray, when they pray for the church, he always thank God for them. So that's what Paul is saying. And, he'll, and also look at here, we can see that the thanksgiving is directed to God the Father. And he says like this, God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. This is important aspect of, uh, of our Lord, that God is not some sort of a divine being that is so distant to us. He's our Father. And, and that is very crucial for us. And uh, what it means here, how, how do we get, how, how we get to be the son and daughter of God? It says here, we get that through Jesus Christ. It says like, God the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So basically, Jesus the Son of God and God the Father become our Father because we believe in Jesus Christ. We are adopted as sons and daughter, precious sons and daughter of God in Jesus Christ. And that is very important, very crucial uh, in our belief in Jesus Christ because through Jesus, we, we get adoption by God the Father. So our relationship with God is not some sort of a master-slave kind of relationship, but it's a, it's a father-son relationship. It's a very personal relationship. I'm, and that is... Uh, I, I've got three kids, and I know what it is to be a father. To, you know, when 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 we moved from uh, Sydney to Melbourne a few months ago, I have to resign from my well-paid job. Um, and when we moved down here, pack the fam, pack off stuff, and pack the family, and we moved down here. Apart from my kids, you know, being reluctant leaving Sydney for you know leaving their friends. They have not much, you know, hesitance to come with us, you know, come with me and Poppy to, to Melbourne. Why? Well, because they're coming with the father and the mother, right? So the kids come with us and they, they don't worry about things. They, they don't, they're not concerned. They don't, well, Judah didn't come to me and say, well, dad, you resign from your job. We moved to a new city. What, what are we going to eat? What are we going to wear? Where are we going to live? They have no concern of that simply because they know they're coming with their dad. And that is very important for us to see our God Father as our Abba Father, you know, like when Paul says, you know, it, when you have the Spirit of God in you, we can call out our Father as Abba Father. And Abba, the word Abba is Aramaic for Daddy. So it's not just some sort of father in a formal sense but also Father Abba uh, uh, in an in a informal, intimate sense. And that's God, our Father. We have that close access to God, our Father. And that's what Paul says here, that he gave thanks to God, the Father, for the Colossians. So, but unlike me, the Father, for my three kids, God, the Father, is, will not fail 
and will not disappoint, right? There are things that I would like to be able to give to my kids that I think it's good for them that I can't give. But whatever God thinks, God our Father thinks that is what is good for us, He can give because not only that God the Father is loving, but He is also all-powerful. I'm a loving father to my children, but I'm not all-powerful. There are things that I can't give them, even though I know if I give them, this is probably good for them, whatever that is. But because I'm not all-powerful, I can't do that. So it is good to know that we have God who is not just loving, that wants the best for us, but He's also all-powerful. He can do that for us. Um, and let me read to you Matthew 6. This is part of the scripture that we read already. Matthew 6, 30 by Stella. Matthew 6, 33, 31 to 33. Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat? What shall we drink? What shall we wear? For the Gentile seeks after all these things. And your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. But seek, seek first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all these things will be added to you. And that's the promise of God. Let us not be anxious because we have God the Father who loves us and is powerful. The opposite is very important as well. If you see the aspect of God as, well, God is powerful, God is holy, He can do anything, He can punish us, but we have also have to see that He's also loving at the same time. You know what I mean? So these two aspects of our God is really important. The, the second things I want to highlight here in verse 3 I'm, we're still on one verse here, okay? So that's why I'm saying we're going to speed up. But let's, let's start slow. Giving thanks. So Paul is giving thanks. This is very, very important to see. Why? Because we don't normally give thanks for someone. When you look at someone's achievement. Like, so Paul, we're going we're gonna to look at later on why Paul gives thanks, right? But when we, when we have a friend, when we have a brother, when we have a sister... When they do something and we want to appreciate them, we don't usually say, I give thanks to God for what you've done. Usually we say, well, congratulations if they achieve certain things or I thank you. Um, but Paul do it quite differently that I think it's quite interesting. Basically, he sees something that is good in the church and he gives thanks to God for them and he's telling them, I'm giving thanks to God whenever I remember you in my prayer. So what, what is the important things here? I've seen a couple of things that is important um, with, with Paul doing this. When, when you give thanks um, to God for someone, when you do that, when Paul's doing that, you, we're basically telling that person that you can do that. You're great because what God has done in you. Rather than you're great, you're good because you're good. So Paul is telling them, Colossians, you, you, you are amazing. But he didn't stop there. He said, you're amazing, and I'm giving thanks to God because you're amazing because of what God has done in you. So he sees people through the lens of God. So when you see the good things in people's life, you're giving thanks to God because what God has done in them. And that's what Paul is doing here. So when, when we congratulate someone, you're basically are telling that, that person, well, thank you, you're great. But when you thank God for someone, you basically say, you're great because what God has done to you, in you. So Paul is teaching the Colossians that what they have, what the church in Colossae have, is because of what God has entrusted them, what God has given them. So there's nothing that the Colossians can take credit from for themselves. Because if they, as we will see soon, is that they have faith and they have love, Paul says. And that's why he's giving thanks to God. But the Colossians can't, can't take credit for it. They can't say, well, I'm great. I, you know, I have faith in Christ. I, I love people. Paul says, well, all good. But you do that because of what God has done. Is that all right so far? We get that? And that's very important for us. When we have this kind of attitude, then we will not be a prideful Christian. We, we, we won't be boasting of what we have achieved and our, our possessions because we know what we have and what we 
have achieved and what we have in our possession is because of what Christ has done, what God has given us. And that is very crucial in, in Paul's thanksgiving here, you know. So it's amazing how when you give thanks, there's so much in it. And every time I, I look into Paul's letters, I always learn something that, you know, that is so rich if you just would slow down in our reading. You know, we, in fact, reading the scripture is not that hard. What it's hard, what makes it hard is because we tend to rush. We want to get done reading two chapters, three chapters, or a book, rather than, I'm going to read three verses and really get it, you know? So if you would just slow down and read carefully, we would, we would get so much more. And that's what I'm trying to do here. So when Paul gives thanks, instead of congratulating the church, he basically say, don't be prideful. You, don't have, you can't boast about this, that you, that the fact that you have faith and that you are a loving church. But be grateful for what God has done in you. So verse 4. Since we have heard of your faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that you have for all the saints. And that's verse 4. So verse 4 is the reason why now. We look at the reason why Paul gives thanks, right? Paul says, because of your faith, they have heard of the faith in their faith in Christ Jesus and of the love that they have for all the saints. So because of their faith and love, their faith in Christ Jesus and their love for the saints, saints here simply means brothers and sisters in Christ, not a special, talented, or especially good Christians. So for that reason, for their love for the saints and their faith in Christ Jesus, Paul gives thanks to God. So now when it comes to faith, everyone has faith, right? I have faith, you have faith, and... It's your friends, your non-believing friends. If you don't believe in Christ Jesus, you have faith. Why? Well, for those who believe in Christ Jesus, we have faith that when we die one day, we will be with Jesus. That there is eternal life after death. Now, if you don't believe in Christ Jesus, you would have faith that when you die, one of the faith that you would have, that when you die, you will be dead. That's it, full stop. But that is faith. How do you know when you die, there's no eternal life? You, you need some sort of faith, right? Because you just don't know. So everyone has faith. Whether you are, whether you are Christians or we, whether you are atheists. Atheists have faith. They have faith that there's no God. So that is why Paul says here, when he mentioned the faith, it's not just any faith. The object of the faith for the church here is faith in Christ Jesus. It's very explicit that their faith, the object of their faith is Christ Jesus. This is important because when we put our faith, because if we don't put our faith in Christ, in the Lord, then we must have put our faith in something else. Let me explain this. When, when we move down here, when I resign from my well-paid job, I have faith that God will provide. But if I don't have that, I could have faith in my bank account. There's so many of us are not worried about, when, when we read the scriptures, the Matthew 6, that say, you know, do not be anxious what you shall eat, what we shall drink. A lot of times, because we have faith in our bank account, because we say, well, we've got no food, but I know my bank account have some cash, I can just go to, you know, Maccas around the corner and get food. But that's not what, what it says here when it says that do not be anxious for what you eat, what you wear. What it's saying here is when you do that, when you're not anxious, when you know there's a guarantee of your faith in Christ Jesus, not because of what you have. Sometimes we say, well, Yes, I don't have money, but I have faith in, in my ability. I got a degree. I'm capable. I can always find job. And that's not what God is talking about, not Paul is talking about. Have faith in Christ Jesus. Mean, even when you don't feel like you're qualified, that you can't do anything, God says, have faith in Christ Jesus because He's a good Father to us. So our faith 
the proper object of our faith must be in Christ Jesus. That has to be clear. Otherwise, then we because we there will be competing object in the world that seeks our faith, that wants our faith in that thing or in that person. And a lot of uh, people would have nothing. They have no worry because they have faith in their parents. Because they say, well, I've got nothing, but my parents have lots. I have faith in them to provide for me, to take care of me. But that's not what Paul is talking about here. Paul says, when you have faith, Make sure that object of faith is Jesus. When we have, when we put our faith in Christ Jesus, what we're saying out loud is this: that Christ, the Lord our God Jesus Christ, is enough for us. That when everything else is being stripped away from our life, we can say. I'm content. And that is what happened when we put our faith in Christ Jesus. We basically just do that. We, we basically say, God, thank you for, for everything else that you've given me. My job, my income, my study, my, my wife, my husband, my boyfriend, my girlfriend, my parents, my house. But even... If everything's been taken away, it is enough. And that's what putting your faith in Christ Jesus means. And that is why when you read the early Christians in, in the book of Acts, they live a radical life. They can do that. Why can't they? Because they have the right object of faith. They don't put their faith in their job, in their job security. They don't put their faith in their family. They put their faith in Christ Jesus. That's why they can live radically for Christ. And when we have this kind of faith, this saving faith in Christ Jesus, then we have the ability to love others freely. A lot of us, many of us can't love others generously and freely because we hold so tightly of what we have. Because we say we have faith in Christ, but we don't really. Because when we have faith in Christ, it will set us free from our possessions. We will be generous people will be loving people. In fact, the early Christians, they are known to the Gentiles, the non-believers, to the pagans because of their love. Like even the emperor say, these Christians, they are crazy. Not only that they look after their own, they look after our, own, our poor people as well. Even though they don't have much, not only that they give, all that they have, they share all they have, to their brothers and sisters in, in their community who believe in Christ, in, in Christ, they also look after our poor who don't believe in Christ. This is crazy. What kind of love is this? And there's no wonder in the early Christianity, the spread of Christianity is just, just, you know, crazy. It's just awesome because people have the right object of faith. They don't rely on what they have and what they can do. They rely on Christ. Jesus. So, verse 5. I need to speed up. Because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of these you have heard before the word of the truth, the gospel. Now, we've looked at the faith and love of the Colossians. If, you are, if you've been Christians long enough, when the word faith comes, and when the word love comes, you expect the third word. And the third word is hope. Right? And that's what Paul is talking about here because of the hope laid out for you in heaven. So what Paul is saying here is the Christians in Colossae can love and can have faith because they have hope. That's what he's saying. Because of your hope that laid up in heaven. Now, if we ask, well, I can't, mm, I'm not sure about my faith. I'm not sure if I can love others so freely and so generously then we have to question, why, why can't we do that, right? And what Paul's saying here, the Colossians can do that because they have hope that is laid in heaven. Now, when you have hope that is laid up in heavens for you, then you can love freely. Now, do you have hope like the Colossians have hope? So when I say hope here, when Paul says hope here, it's not 
some kind of wishful thinking kind of hope like when you buy lottery tickets you say I hope I'm gonna win a million dollars it's not that kind of hope the hope here is a certainty that will happen in a future date and that's the hope that they have in Christ Jesus being adopted as son they have guarantee that when they die they will be with Jesus and that is certain that is guaranteed they have that hope that's why they can sing come Lord Jesus because they know if Jesus come they will be with Christ and when Paul says in in the Philippians you know um, that for him to die is gain since when death is gain well if death means meeting the Lord Jesus Christ that is gain and that's and that is what we need we need hope in Christ so that we can live in faith and live lovingly so that's what enable Christian to to live a remarkable and radical life it's that their hope their guarantee that whatever happened to them they have a guarantee of eternal life with Christ and that's our guarantee so we, we we can be generous we can be loving because of that so why do missionaries leave the comfort want to leave the comfort of their home and their country to serve in a dangerous places risking their lives risking everything that they have sell everything that they have why do they do that well because of their hope in Christ because they know in the scheme of eternity their lives on earth whatever that may be 80 years 100 years that's like a dot so if you living in this time if you look at the timeline of your life it's like this big probably right so look at if, if you look at a computer screen for example a 20 inch computer screen if you zoom in to 50 years right that if you're 50 then that will fill up the whole screen right but if you zoom into 200 years zoom out to 200 years well, it's a, your 50 years will fill up, what, a quarter of the screen, right? If you zoom up 500 years, well, you fill up only 10% of the screen. Now try to keep zooming out to eternity. Your 100 years, my 100 years on Earth, is not even a pixel on the screen. And that's how insignificant our time is on Earth, how short that is on Earth compared to eternity. And that is Paul's perspective here, that we have hope of the eternity. Now, we're living in that dot. What are you going to do with your life during that time, that dot in your life? And that's what God is asking of each and every one of us when we meet Him one day. What have you done during that dot of your time on earth? In the scheme of eternity, that's nothing. But yet, we pour everything. We invest everything. We concentrate all our efforts, all our investment. For what? For the 40 years of our retirement. Or 50 years if we're lucky. Right? If we're healthy. But we forget to invest in the eternity. How do you invest in eternity? Well, have hope so we can live generously. We can live for others. And that's the call of our lives. So the Colossians heard about the gospel, right? Let me read to you. Because, first five, because of the hope laid up for you in heaven, of these you have heard before in the word of truth, the gospel. Let me say to you, the gospel needs to be heard. No one gets saved while sleeping, not hearing anything. No one. You can only get saved if you have heard about the truth. You may not get saved right at that point of time, but you need to hear the gospel. I need to hear the gospel in order for my heart to be transformed, for God to work in me, right? So if there's, let's say there's a, a group of people who never heard the gospel, they will never come to know Christ. They need some. That's why there's missionaries who go there and talk to them about the gospel. Once the gospel is being preached, then they can be transformed. They can be saved. So Paul says here, why the Colossians live the way they live? Because they have heard the good news. 
the gospel is pretty much is the good news, right? So the word gospel is basically euangelion, really in Greek. Really, it means just the good news, and it's a it's a it's a war or battle term. Euangelion is a you know a, a battle kind of war kind of terminology. So back in the days before there's internet, right? Uh, some of you probably don't know that, right? Like jazz, maybe when you're born, there's already internet. But there was a time when there was no internet, right? When there is war, when there's a battle between cities, how do the town people know they've won? Well, they have a messenger running, right? The messenger will run back to the city and say, We've won! We've won! That is the gospel. That is euangelion, the good news. The news of victory. And we preach the gospel. When we preach the gospel, we preach the news of victory. Victory from what? Well, victory from sins and victory from death. When all Lord Christ Jesus died on the cross, He says, it is finished. What, in, what, 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 did, he, what did He mean by that? What it means is like, well, sin has no longer power over you. And death no longer has power over you because three days later, Jesus raised from the dead. And he's the first who will be raised and we will be raised from the dead with him. And that is news, good news of victory. We have victory. So when, when people say, oh, there will be Armageddon at the end times, well, let me tell you, there's anti-climax. We know how it ends. It's like there's a big spoiler in the Bible telling us how it's going to end, right? So when we come to this, like, ah, yeah, well, it's just what the Bible says. We won. So it's not some kind of cliffhanger and, you know, oh, wow, I didn't expect that result. We will know that. And the difference is, and, and the Bible says, when that time comes, every knee shall bow, every knee, not just the believers, not just those who believe in Christ Jesus, but every knee will bow. What it means is, even those who don't believe in Christ Jesus will bow down and acknowledge that Christ is King and Lord. But it will be too late for them. But they will know then that He is King, that He is Lord. So for all of us here in this place, if Jesus is not your Lord and King, this is the time to acknowledge that He is our Lord, He's your Lord and your King. Because the Bible says when He comes, every knee will know, every knee will bow, every tongue will confess. Every, not just the believers, every knee will bow, every tongue confess that He is King of kings, Lord of lords. So that's the gospel, victory over sins. That's the good news, victory over sins and death for what Christ has done on the cross for us. So the Colossians have faith and they have love because of... The because of what? Because they have hope in Christ Jesus. They have hope because what? In here we've just read, they heard the gospel. Right? They heard the gospel because what? Somebody preached to them. For someone preached to them about the gospel. So the cure, I believe the cure of the sickness in the world that we're living in today is not more programs by the government, you know, um, or more security in place, more policemen or if, the, if just Australia, for example, to be just more pros, prosper, have more factories, then we'll be fine. No, but I, what I believe the cure for the sickness of our world today, not just Australia, but the whole world, is the gospel. The world need to hear the good news. The world need to have the hope in Christ Jesus. Because when you see the war, when you see the slaughtering of innocent people, if they don't have hope, in Christ, they don't have hope in eternity, then that's it. They will die in vain. But because we have hope, we know they will not die in vain. Those who die in Christ, they will be with Jesus. That's eternity. So that's just what Paul is saying here. And also he says not just the gospel, but also the, the gospel is the word of truth. And I want to highlight this because there's so many so-called gospel quote and quote being preached today and the di difference here paul want to say is the true gospel is the word of truth if there's a true gospel that means there's a false gospel what is this false gospel you can read it actually 
there is in, in you know in, in the Bible. But I want to highlight one from uh, from Galatians one regarding false gospel. Galatians one verse six to nine, Paul says this: I'm astonished that you Galatians are so quickly deserting him, Christ, who call you in the grace of Christ, and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even, Paul says this to them, but even if we, Paul, and the team, or an angel from heaven should preach to you a different gospel, a gospel contrary to the one we have preached to you, let him be a curse. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you have received, let him be a curse. What Paul is saying here is, there is another gospel, quote, unquote. But if anyone dare to preach that false gospel, that person will be cursed. And Paul is saying this, don't believe those preachers who preach the false gospel. He said, even if angels come down from heaven and preach to you a gospel different to what Paul has preached, let that be a curse. Let the angels be a curse. Paul is very serious here about the true gospel because there's so many false gospels being preached today. And one of them I highlight uh, last week where the false gospel could be a true gospel plus something else. So on the surface, it feels like, yes, this is the right gospel, but then they add more things. It's like, oh, you got to believe in Christ Jesus, but you also need this in order for you to be saved. In Paul's category, that is a false gospel because what Christ has done on the cross is enough. So people need to hear the gospel in order for them to have hope so that they can have faith in Christ Jesus so they can live a loving life, a, a generous and unselfish life. So I've heard some people say this, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. Have you heard that? Have you heard that? Like people say, preach the gospel all the time and when necessary, use words. I've heard that. And when I first time heard of it, I thought like, man, boy, that is amazing. And they use that. They, they say that in order to justify that we can preach the gospel without words, that we just do. You don't have to preach the gospel with words. You just love people. You just give to the poor. But I don't believe that anymore. I disagree with that statement now. Um, because what Romans 10, 17 says, Romans 10, 17 says this, so faith comes from hearing and hearing through the word of Christ. There's so many people out there giving to the poor, serving the poor. If no one tells them about Christ, about hope in Christ Jesus, they will never know Christ. They'll just say, well, this, this dude who just gave me food and feed me every week or every day, that's it, he's a nice guy. Somebody need to tell, somebody need to preach the good news. It does not mean though, oh, and then there's another one that says, uh, maybe you, if you haven't heard that one before, you might have heard this one. Your action speaks louder than your words. Yeah? Your action speaks louder than words. To justify, just do it, don't say anything. Well, Maybe, but not when it comes to the preaching the gospel. Somebody has to do it so that people can hear it and believe. Now, I'm not suggesting that, proclaim, that when we proclaim the gospel, we don't follow it up with good works. I'm not saying that. I'm not saying that, well, go to the poor community, preach the good news, and then leave them in their poverty. I'm not saying that. What I'm saying is, Give, live generously, right? Like the early Christians. They, there were a lot of poor among them, but the Bible says they are without lack. They are not lacking. Why? Because they are a community of believers who just share everything. So they don't just preach the good news, they follow it up with their actions. They show it that they believe what they say by their actions. But somebody still has to preach it. Somebody has to say it. Somebody has to share the good news. 
So our actions, our behavior should simply confirm our words. So we cannot say, oh, I'm preaching the gospel. I'm living out what the Bible says, preach the gospel, proclaim the gospel to the ends of the earth, make disciples by doing good, by doing the things, but not really sharing the good news. You can't do that. You just can't do that. Mark 16, 14 to 16 says this, And Jesus said to them, Go into all the world and proclaim the gospel to the whole creation. And whoever believes and is, bap- and is baptized will be saved. And whoever does not believe will be condemned. Now, what are you preaching then? What are you sharing? What is this gospel that we should preach, right? I'm... Um, I want to be practical here because a lot of people say preach the gospel, but what, how do I do that, right? I know how to give to the poor. I know how to do good works, but preaching the gospel, that is hard. You don't know where I work, man. You don't know my friends. You don't know my colleagues. And let me tell you, I work in advertising. I know how hard it is to preach to those group of people, all right? So... Let me read to you one verse before I share with you. This is, this is the essence of the gospel, right? The good news, the news of victory. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4. Now I would remind you, brothers, of the gospel I preached to you. This is Paul. Which you have received, in which you stand, by which you are being saved. If you hold fast to the word I preached to you, unless you believe in vain. For I delivered to you as the first importance that I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the scripture. So that's the first aspect of the gospel, that Christ died for our sins. That he was buried and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the scriptures. And the second aspect is that Christ did not just die, he was raised from the dead on the third day, according to the scriptures. Now let me, let me share with you the practical aspect before we look at quickly verse 6 and 7 and 8. How we share the gospel. The, the simplicity, the sim, gospel is simple. That's why it, it is, I think it is the church and preachers who try to make it complex to justify their positions that only the preacher, the pastor can do the job of preaching the gospel, you know. And you folk, the lay people, the normal people, you can't do that. Leave that job to me. And that is false because the gospel is so simple that everyone else can do it. And Paul has laid out in 1 Corinthians 15, 1 to 4, that the essence of the gospel is that Christ died for your sins. And in that you will have hope of eternal life. That's the essence of it. Now, when you share with somebody who knows nothing about this kind of hope, how you do it, uh, you do it this way. And this is what we call, what I call, I learned this from Poppy because Poppy is a children minister. She works with children. And I find it helpful even for adults. This is called um, No Words Bible or Color Bible. It starts with green. So this is your story when you share, share, share the good news, right? Green is, is in the Bible, it's in the beginning, in the Genesis. The Garden of Eden, where everything is good, everything is perfect as God created men and women in the Garden of Eden, cultivating what God has created. Wrong side. And then the next one, then what happened? Oh, there's that delicious, juicy fruit. And Satan say, go on, Eve, eat it. And that, and they eat it. Adam and Eve eat the fruit. I don't know what fruit it is. It must be delicious and juicy and you know they ate it even though God says do not eat that fruit you can eat everything everything in the garden but that one and yet that one is the one that they ate they fall into sins and that's a black so from the garden of Eden they fall into sin and then they leave when 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 they when humanity sin against God there's no longer this relationship son and father son's daughter's father relationship it's broken right and god don't like that and he sent his son jesus to die for us and that's the red color christ pour out his blood to cleanse our sins away 
so that you know our life, our sins that is black, wash away with the blood of Christ that is red, become white righteous. That's our, white is the righteousness of God. And that's not the end when we are in Christ, when we've been washed away with the righteousness of Christ. That's not the end. You see, a lot of Christian things, that's the end, right? Now we are righteous. Now let's just have fun and enjoy our life in this 80 years, whatever that may be. But then there's another one. This is gold. The gold is the glory. So what God is saying here is the, the story of the Bible, the story of the gospel is when Christ has redeemed you, when you're already righteous, live your life in such a way that you will glorify Christ. So we have a mission when we are in Christ Jesus. We need to live a life that glorify our Lord Jesus Christ. Everything that we do, if you are in Christ Jesus, everything that we do should glorify and bring and point people to Jesus. So when people look at you, people no longer say, Wow, Aaron, you are amazing. They don't see that anymore. They see, Wow, Aaron, I know you are amazing because you have a great God. And that's how we should live our life once we've been washed with the righteousness of God that we glorify Him in everything that we do. Verse 6, which has come to you, so the gospel, the good news, they have heard, they come to you as indeed in the whole world it is bearing fruit and growing as also does, as it also does among you since the day you heard it and understood the grace of God in truth. So what Paul is saying here is when the word come, when they heard, when the Colossians heard it and understood it, what happened? They start to bear fruit. They believe it. They heard it. They believe it. They understood it. And they start bearing fruit. And they start growing. So bearing fruits and growing is part of being a believer. Part of this having hope in Christ. We must bear fruit. What does bear fruits mean? Well, how do you bear fruit? Well, you bear fruit by sharing the word, by sharing the good news. You will not bear fruit if you don't share. You got to share. So you bear fruit and growing. So the gospel preached to them and bearing fruit and growing, both not just in Colossae, but also in the world, Paul is saying here. So what he's saying is in the world. Why, why, why Paul says that? Is because the gospel is not just for the Jews, not just for a select few. The gospel is not just for us in this room, but the gospel is for those out there as well. And that's what the gospel is. And when the gospel is preached, guarantee this, that people's life will be changed. May not be immediate, may not be everyone, but guarantee this. There's a guarantee that when the gospel is preached, it will bear fruit in people's lives. Because there's power in the gospel. And Paul says in Romans 6, 1 16, I'm reading it to you. For I'm, this is Paul saying, For I'm not ashamed of the gospel, Paul says, for it is the power of God for salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jews first and also to the Greek. Again, there's a world aspect here. That when the gospel is preached, people will come to believe. And that is the power. How do people come to believe in Christ when the gospel is preach so don't believe that your actions speak louder than words that you know you can preach the gospel without saying a word you cannot you gotta just share it right if they don't believe you if they reject you they don't really reject you they really reject the news that you bring to them and that is their problem not your problem not my problem because there's power we share it because there's power in the word in the gospel so Paul is reminding the Colossians that they have heard the gospel, that they have received and understood it, and that they are bearing fruit and growing because of it. And what he's saying is, so remember the true gospel. Why? Last week I've touched this a little bit. Why, why he wrote to the Colossians? Because there's false teachers happening, right? Try to delude them, try to lure them away from the true gospel to the false teaching. And Paul is reminding them, you heard the true gospel. You believe it and you're bearing fruit. You are growing. Don't believe them. That's what Paul is saying. And Paul is reminding us as well. You heard the gospel. You believe Christ. You are growing. Look what Christ has done in your life. 
Don't believe in the false teaching. They say you need this, you need that. All that you need has been given to us when Christ died on the cross. Now it's our time to live for the glory of God. It's that golden bit of that Bible there. We've been washed clean, righteous. If we die today, if you believe in Christ Jesus and you die tonight, you'll be with the Father and Jesus in heaven. But since we're still breathing right now, Paul says, if I'm to go on living, right, and I will, that means I will bear fruit. My life will be a fruitful life. Even though Paul says, if I die, that is a gain, that's, that's a good thing. But if I'm to go on living, if I'm breathing right now, my life is this, for the glory of God. I will bear fruit for the glory of God. And let me close in verse 7 and 8. This is just the details, how they heard about the news, right? They heard through someone. Just as, verse 7, just as you learn it from Epaphras, our beloved fellow servant, he is a faithful minister of Christ on your behalf and has made known to us your love in the Spirit. So they heard, the Colossians heard the good news just like us. Somebody preached to them and that somebody is called Epaphras. So the Colossians are not Paul's church. Paul didn't preach to them directly. Uh, so they are not Paul's converts. There are a lot of churches, uh, a lot of letters that Paul write to where he basically are, was the pastor or the someone who preached to them and built the church. But Colossians not one of them. Paul preached, Epaphras got saved, become Paul's convert, a disciple, and, Paul, and Epaphras actually the pastor and preached to the Colossians and they come to know Christ. So you know how, how the church multiplies, how the believers multiplies when the disciple start preaching the word of God, making more disciples. So what Paul is saying here is, you've heard it, you believe it, and you're growing, and you heard it from Epaphras, right? So t- today we are being reminded of the power of God, that when the word of God is being preached, when the gospel is being preached, lives can be transformed. And it is important for us to share that good news, right? Even when, see, I, I don't know why any Christian would not be so quick to share the gospel. Why we want, we, why don't we do that? Because of, you know, it, let, let's say you, you there's a new restaurant opening up and you've been there and it's so good, right? What is the next thing that you'll do? You'll share it. You'll tell people, you'll tell your close friends, you tell your sister, you tell your brothers, you tell everyone. Man, boy, have you heard about that restaurant that just opened around the corner? So good. You should go, right? And imagine if there's bigger sale in the history of Melbourne, right? You can buy, say, a new car for 10% of the price. You would tell everyone, even though you know that person do not need a new car. They say, boy, go to that dealer's 10%. That's all you need to pay. You would tell that. Why? Because it's good news, right? It's great news. But somehow, the great news of eternity, we just feel like, oh, I just want to keep it to myself, you know? And the good news is not man just for yourself. We're being selfish if we do that. You know why we're selfish if we don't do that? If, if we truly believe that the good news, hope in Christ is the key to eternity, that means we're happy for those that we know who do not know Christ, for them to die and rot in hell. That's what it means. Because we know if they do not know Christ, And if they die, they will not have eternal life with Christ. And are you okay with that? If you walk down the street tomorrow morning and there's some kid crossing the street when it's red and there's a car fast approaching, wouldn't you shout to that kid, run, get out of the way. Car is coming about to hit you and kill you. Wouldn't you do that? 
You would do that, and that kid is a stranger, right? You don't even know that kid. Why would you do that? Because you know if you don't do that, that kid will be dead. And imagine if that kid, well, who is this stranger telling me to get out of the way? I'm just going to keep walking. What would you do? You would run and try to grab that kid and move him away from the street. You would say, get out of the street, kid. Why? Well, because we believe that car is real. And if that car hit that kid, he'll be really dead. And if you truly believe that there is hope in Christ Jesus, we will not be hesitant to share the good news. Because otherwise, that means we don't really believe what we believe, what we say we believe. Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. And Father, we thank you tonight for your word, for the gospel, the good news, the hope that we have in Christ Jesus. Thank you for your son Jesus who died for us on the cross and by believing in your son, our sins been washed away. We are now righteous before you. If you die tonight, we will be with you tonight for eternity. And I pray, Lord, if there's any one of us in this place who do not know you, who do not confess that you are our Lord and Savior, start working in us. We ask humbly that the Holy Spirit continue to work in every heart tonight. Convict us, rebuke us, mold us, transform us tonight. And if we are already your sons and daughters, but yet sometimes we are hesitant to share the good news with others, I pray that your word continue to convict us. That what we have, the gospel, is good news that ought to be preached, to be shared with others. Give us the boldness and the courage to share this good news to those around us, to our circle of influence that you have entrusted us with. That could be our neighbors, that could be our friends, that could be our mother, that could be our father, that could be our brother or sister. Whoever they may be, Lord, I pray that you give us the courage to share the good news with them because we love them. Thank you, Lord. In Jesus' mighty name, we pray.